This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 78, for broadcast on the 3rd of October, 2018. Coming up on Space Time. Evidence for a third Magellanic cloud. Astronomers spot Spock's planet Vulcan. And brown dwarves are getting even more mysterious. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests that two of the closest galaxies to the Milky Way, the large and small Magellanic Clouds, may have had a third galactic companion. The findings, reported in the journal Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, are based on retrograde motions of a group of stars within the large Magellanic Cloud. The large and small Magellanic Clouds are two dwarf galaxies clearly visible in the southern night skies to the unaided eye. The Large Magellanic Cloud is about 160,000 light-years away, making it one of our nearest galactic neighbours, while the Small Magellanic Cloud is only slightly further away, at around 200,000 light-years. The study's lead author, Benjamin Armstrong, from the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research in the University of Western Australia, says the observations suggest another galaxy was likely engulfed by the Large Magellanic Cloud sometime around 3 to 5 billion years ago. Most of the stars in the Magellanic Cloud rotate clockwise around the galactic centre. But unusually, there's a population of stars which rotate anticlockwise. Now, astronomers originally thought that these stars might have come from its companion galaxy, the small Magellanic Cloud. There's a gravitational tidal stream of stars linking the two and then extending from them onto the Milky Way. To find out what's going on, Armstrong and colleagues use computer modelling to simulate possible galactic merger scenarios. The idea being these stars may well have come from a past merger with another galaxy. The authors found a merging event resulting in strong counter-rotation after the merger takes place. And this simulation was consistent with the stellar observations made. The findings could also help explain other observations which have perplexed astronomers for years, namely why stars in the Large Magellanic Cloud are generally either very old or very young. That problem is based on observations of star clusters, which usually contain large populations of stars originally formed at the same time from the same molecular gas and dust cloud. In the Milky Way, these star clusters are all very old. But in the Large Magellanic Cloud, astronomers have seen both very old and very young star clusters, but nothing in between. And that suggests that something's happened during the evolution of the Large Magellanic Cloud, which has triggered a fresh round of starburst. Armstrong says the galactic merger could help explain both the age gap problem and why the Large Magellanic Cloud appears to have a thick disk. He says while the work's still very preliminary, it does suggest that this sort of process could have been responsible for the thicker disk in the past. The large and small Magellanic Clouds are quite unusual galaxies in some ways. They have a lot of properties that the Milky Way our galaxy doesn't share. In the large Magellanic Cloud, one of the unusual features is that there's the population of stars that doesn't seem to be doing what all the other stars are doing. So where the large Magellanic Cloud is moving clockwise, these stars are moving anti-clockwise. What do you put that down to? So it was originally thought these stars had come from the small Magellanic Cloud, but the direction that they're spinning doesn't really make sense for that to have occurred. So our idea was that these, are, these stars would have logically come from a different galaxy that has since been merged with the Large Magellanic Cloud, or eaten, as it were. Because when we look at galaxies, we know they grow through a process of merging or cannibalization. In fact, right now, there are stellar streams and uh, Magellanic bridges between the small and Large Magellanic Clouds and between the Magellanic Clouds and the Milky Way. So we know this process is going on. We can look at star trails within our own galaxy. Stars there are traveling at different velocities, even in different directions compared to surrounding stars. And that's caused because our own galaxy has been consuming stars from other galaxies. And that's sort of what you're seeing in your computer simulations of the LMC. Yeah, we can use, uh, as you mentioned, things like the Magellanic Bridge and the stream. They're all very direct evidence that we can see in the sky of these sort of interactions having taken place. So with using our simulations, we can reproduce many of these features, but the 
these simulations require a different sort of interaction to something that would create these counterfeiting stars. So for our simulations, we've shown that you need a different kind of interaction to create the stars we see in the Large Magellanic Cloud. When we look at both the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, we think that they were once little spiral galaxies that have been madly disrupted. And everyone thought that was because, well, they're so close to the Milky Way, the Milky Way's gravitational pull would have perturbed them. But I guess if there was a, a third galaxy involved, that would also explain that, wouldn't it? It's very possible. We certainly know that the Magellanic Clouds have been interacting with each other for quite some time in the past, and that the Milky Way is a relative newcomer to their interactions. So um, the idea that if this merger has taken place in the past, it could very much explain some of the unusual things we do see in the um, large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, for example, the large Magellanic Cloud has a quite unusually thick galactic disk, which we probably wouldn't expect to see in its kind of galaxy. However, our simulations have shown that this kind of merging process that we've proposed can cause a thickened disk. So it does help us explain features that we couldn't otherwise understand. When we look at the Magellanic Clouds and their relationship with the Milky Way, there's been in the past a lot of debate in the astronomical community as to whether they're actually satellite galaxies of the Milky Way or whether they're just sort of side-swiping us as they go along their own way and have now been caught up in the Milky Way's gravity well. If they are just caught up recently, then this could well be their first close pass by the Milky Way. And depending on the age of when their close encounter began, if these other stars that seem to have different properties to those of the rest of the stars in the clouds, you could be able to date that then. Yeah, you know, for a long time, we did think that the Magellanic Clouds were interacting with the Milky Way throughout all of their history. But in the last few years, well, the leading theory has been that they're currently undergoing their first pass. So with that knowledge in mind, we can look at these different stars to essentially look back at the history of the Magellanic Clouds. And from that, we can piece together certain facts about them, such as when this merging must have occurred, what this means for the actual small and large Magellanic Clouds themselves. And then we can also use it to sort of intuit some information about what this must have meant when they started interacting with the Milky Way itself. And of course, it's important to know how galaxies interact with each other because the Milky Way in about, what, 3.7 billion years from now is about to be gobbled up by an even bigger galaxy called Andromeda M31. <laughs> Definitely. It's uh, really important, particularly for the um, large and small Magellanic Cloud, to understand them in as much detail as possible because they're so close to us. And so they make for the best way to actually understand how galaxies change over time. So they're essentially sort of like um, a great laboratory for galaxy evolution. So by studying the large and small Magellanic Clouds, you get to study things in a different way. Yeah, it's, um, it's basically the best way we can have a really detailed look at what a real galaxy interaction actually results in. We can study galaxies that are really distant, but when it comes to the Magellanic Clouds, the detail we get is so much more than just about anything else. So that's where we read all our theories of how galaxies change, how they interact, and that's where they put the test. And they're so easy to see, too, because the only other major galaxy that's interacting with the Milky Way right now is the Sagittarius Dwarf, and it's on the other side of the galaxy. It's hard to see with everything in the way. <laughs> yeah, they're really ideal for that. That's Benjamin Armstrong from the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research and the University of Western Australia. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have spotted a planet orbiting the star 40 Eridani A. That's the same star Gene Rodenberry wrote about in the Star Trek science fiction saga as being the host star for Mr Spock's home planet Vulcan. For those who aren't familiar with Star Trek, and I can't believe there's anyone listening who's not, Spock served as science officer aboard the Starship Enterprise, whose mission was to boldly go where no man had gone before and seek out strange new worlds. A report in the monthly notices the Royal Astronomical Society describes the newly discovered exoplanet as being roughly twice the size of Earth and orbiting just inside its host star's habitable zone with a 42-day period. Located just 16 light-years away, HD 2696540 Eridini A is a spectral type K orange dwarf star, only slightly less massive and cooler than the Sun. It's around the same age as the Sun, between 4 and 5 billion years old, and has a 10.1 Earthy magnetic cycle, nearly identical to the Sun's 11.6-year solar cycle. 
The other two stars in the system, 40 Eridani B and C, are a binary composed of a white dwarf and a spectral type M red dwarf flare star. Just as importantly, the newly discovered exoplanet is the nearest super-Earth orbiting a sun-like star. It was discovered as part of the Dharma Planetary Survey using the dedicated 50-inch Tennessee State University telescope at the Mount Lemmon Observatory in southern Arizona. One of the study's authors, Yan Ji from the University of Florida, says the discovery shows how high-cadence, high-precision radial velocity observations can play a key role in the discovery of Earth-like planets in the habitable zones around nearby stars. The habitable, Goldilocks zone as it's sometimes called, is a region around a star where the temperatures are not too hot and not too cold, but just right for liquid water to pool on the surface of a terrestrial world under the right atmospheric conditions. Liquid water, of course, is essential for life as we know it. One of the study's co-authors, Gregory Henry from Tennessee State University, says Mr. Spock's home world of Vulcan was connected to 40 Eridani A in the publication Star Trek II by James Blish and Star Trek Maps by Jeff Maynard. Furthermore, in a letter published in Sky and Telescope magazine back in July 1991, Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry and colleagues confirmed the identification of 40 Eridani A as Vulcan's host star. At the time, they wrote that the 40 Eridani star system is composed of three stars. Vulcan orbits the primary star, 40 Eridani A, and the two companion stars would gleam brilliantly in the Vulcan sky. The study's lead author, Bo Ma, also from the University of Florida, says unlike the host stars of most known exoplanets discovered so far, 40 Eridani A can be seen with the unaided eye. So on a clear night, you can point out Spock's home. If you're a big enough geek, that is. And yes, I am, so just look towards the constellation Eridanus, and we've included a map in the Space Time Tumblr blog. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Astronomers are scratching their heads about the distinction between brown dwarfs and true stars after discovering a brown dwarf that's far brighter than it should be for its size. Brown dwarfs are failed stars. They form them the same way as normal stars, but they don't accumulate enough mass to sustain the core nuclear fusion process which makes stars shine. Instead, they fill the gap between the largest planets and the smaller stars. Brown dwarfs have a similar diameter to Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, and they're between about 13 and 65 times Jupiter's mass, or if you prefer, below 0.08 solar masses. While they can't fuse protium hydrogen, they can fuse another form of hydrogen, deuterium, as well as lithium. And while some start their lives as brown dwarfs, others are thought to start out with enough mass to begin life as spectral type M red dwarf stars. However, they then go on to lose enough mass during their evolution to cease core hydrogen fusion, turning them from red dwarfs into brown dwarfs. At least that's the hypothesis. But what makes these objects so mysterious is that astronomers really have very little true understanding about how they evolve over time. Astronomers base their hypothetical models of brown dwarf formation and evolution on observations of these objects. And these models require independently determined masses, radii, luminosities and ages. The problem is, astronomers are yet to get all four of these parameters for a single brown dwarf. One of these key parameters is usually either missing or it's been calculated using other models rather than direct observations, and all this results in significant uncertainties. Now, a report in the Astrophysical Journal has concluded that a recently discovered brown dwarf, catalogued as CWW89AB, doesn't fit the parameters. CWW89AB was discovered last year by NASA's Kepler-2 mission. It was found orbiting a distant sun-like star in the Rupert 147 Open Star Cluster, about a thousand light years away in the constellation Sagittarius. Using transits and radial velocities, the authors determined its radius at about 0.94 Jupiter radii and a mass of about 37 times that of Jupiter. Being a dispersed open star cluster allowed astronomers to extremely accurately and precisely determine its age by looking at the main sequence turnoff of other stars in the cluster. It turned out to be about 2.5 to 3.25 billion years old. The authors then used NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope to observe the brown dwarf passing behind its stellar companion, a process known as secondary eclipse. 
The depth of the eclipse represents how much light from the brown dwarf is being blocked out by the sun-like star. Surprisingly, they found that CWW89AB is some 16 times more luminous than it should be based on predictions from evolutionary models. This means that its brightness temperature of around 1,700 Kelvin, despite brown dwarf evolution models suggesting it should be closer to 850 Kelvin. The authors thought the overluminosity or temperature difference could be caused by the nearby main sequence star heating up the brown dwarf, making it hotter and thus more luminous than models predicted. However, calculations show that even if the brown dwarf absorbed all the stellar radiation it was receiving from the neighbouring star and kept all that heat just on the side facing the star without transporting any of it to the other side, it still wouldn't reach the temperatures being observed. Also, a hotter brown dwarf would mean a larger brown dwarf, and that wouldn't match the radius observations observed. Something else must be making CWW89AB brighter while still keeping it at its observed size. Another possibility is a temperature inversion in the brown dwarf's atmosphere, in which the temperature goes up as the altitude increases and the pressure decreases. Similar effects can be seen in Earth's atmosphere and the stratosphere, and also on classes of exoplanets called hot Jupiters, which orbit very close in to their host stars. However, hot Jupiters with temperature inversions have temperatures higher than 2000 Kelvin. That's far greater than the 1700 Kelvin observed on CWW89AB, so that's probably not it either. A third possibility is that the brown dwarf features an overabundance of carbon compared to oxygen in its composition. If so, it wouldn't be able to radiate its internal heat away, but would still be able to absorb large amounts of heat from its parent star and this would make its upper atmosphere much hotter than models predict. Of course, there's always the possibility that science's models of brown dwarfs are simply too imprecise, or that they're missing important information. The authors are now hoping to undertake more observations of this mysterious brown dwarf, but that's a job which may need the improved capabilities of the yet-to-be-launched James Webb Space Telescope, and that's now not expected to fly any earlier than March 30, 2021, depending on evaluation testing. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. SpaceX boss Elon Musk has announced plans to fly a space tourist to the moon. 42-year-old Japanese billionaire and online fashion tycoon Yuzaku Mizawa has paid an undisclosed amount to fly himself and a selected bunch of companions on SpaceX's proposed new BFR rocket. Mazawa describes himself as a patron of the arts, and he wants to take between six and eight artists with him, including painters, sculptors, photographers, writers, fashion designers and architects. Thank you, Elon. Thank you, everyone. I am from Japan. My name is Yusaku Mazawa. Finally, I can tell you that I choose to go to the moon. I don't like being alone. So I want to share these experiences and things with as many people as possible. So, that is why I choose to go to the moon with artists. I choose to invite artists from around the world on my journey. Including a single orbit of the moon, the journey should take about a week. The journey dwarfs the seven multi-millionaire space tourists who have so far flown aboard Russian Soyuz rockets to the International Space Station, including one who went twice. SpaceX founder Elon Musk. The purpose of SpaceX, the reason for creating SpaceX was to accelerate the advent of humanity becoming a space-faring civilization, to help advance rocket technology to the point where we could potentially become a multi-planet species and a true space-faring civilization. So as we consider sort of the fossil record, the history of civilization, it's important to bear in mind like there could be some natural event or some man-made event that ends civilization as we know it or in life as we know it. And so it's important that we try to become a multi-planet civilization, extend life beyond Earth, and to do so as quickly as we can. That window of opportunity may be open for a long time, or it may be open for a short time, but we should not assume that it is open for a long time. We should take action and become a multi-planet civilization as soon as possible. And that, that's kind of like the, the defensive reason. And I want to, do want to emphasize it's, it's multi-planetary, not single planet, but somewhere else. We want to become a multi-planet civilization, have life on, on Mars, Moon, maybe Venus, the moons Jupiter, and throughout the solar system, and then ultimately extend life beyond the solar system to other star systems. But I think that's the future that's incredibly exciting. The moon flight, 
estimated for 2023, will use SpaceX's proposed next-generation super heavy-lift rocket, the BFR, which we're told stands for Big Falcon Rocket. Musk's used the space tourist announcement to also unveil the latest designs for the BFR. At 118 metres, the vehicle, which is designed for interplanetary transport, will be 12 metres taller than previously envisaged. The two-stage reusable launch vehicle will be able to carry a 100-ton payload into orbit. The system also includes specialist ground infrastructure for rapid launch and relaunch, as well as zero-gravity propellant transfer technology designed for deployment in low-Earth orbit. Unlike earlier designs, the upper stage now features steerable canards, as well as two rear-mounted radially adjustable wings, which also act as landing legs. There's a third landing leg, which looks like a vertical stabiliser, but has no actual aerodynamic function. The 9-metre diameter BFR will use seven cryogenic methalox fueled Raptor rocket motors, which have been under development since 2012. In 10 years, we got from tiny rockets barely making it to orbit to the world's biggest rocket by far, with reusable boost stages and sending a car to Mars. So it's an update on BFR itself. The design, the production design of BFR is different in some important ways from what I presented about a year ago. Overall, it is 118 meters long. The payload is still similar. It's about 100 metric tons. Actually, technically 100 metric tons all the way to Mars because of orbital refueling. So BFR is is designed to be able to take 100 tons all the way to the surface of Mars, maybe Ceres, but, but if you have a propellant depot on Mars, you're able to get from Mars to the asteroid belt to the moons of Jupiter and kind of like planet and moon hop all the way to the outer solar system. So BFR is really intended as an interplanetary transport system that's capable of getting from Earth to anywhere in the solar system as you establish propellant depots along the way. So we've increased the payload section to be over a thousand cubic meters. I think it'll probably end up being probably something around 1100 cubic meters. There are forward actuated fins and rear actuated fins. The way that BFR flies is somewhat counterintuitive. If you apply your sort of normal intuition, it will not make sense. There's the two forward actuated flaps, and then there are two rear actuated wings or fins or flaps. They're not exactly comparable to anything else out there. But you, you kind of want you want, kind of want four control surfaces to be able to control the vehicle through a wide range of atmospheric densities and velocities. So the way it operates is kind of more like a skydiver than an aircraft. Almost the entire time when it's re-entering, it is just trying to break. It's just trying to stop. So it's, it's doing everything it can to shed velocity while distributing that force over the most amount of surface area possible. So two of the three rear fins actuate. They're like giant wings. It actually requires an enormous amount of force to move those wings. It's sort of in the mega Newton class of force. The third uh, fin or wing, wing-like structure is actually d- does not actuate. And, and it is not a vertical stabilizer as it may appear. It is actually just a leg. So during the high velocity portion of entry, it's in the lee of the wind, and it really doesn't have any aerodynamic purpose, and it's really just a leg. It looks the same as the other ones for purposes of the symmetry. And then obviously, if you're landing on the moon, you don't need any aerodynamic surfaces at all because you just there's no there's no air. You just need thrusters. So next, the next steps with uh, BFR are we're obviously gonna, we're going to build it, or we are building it. So BFR is nine meters in diameter. It's really quite enormous. So we've built the first cylinder section of the BFR prototype, and we'll be building the the domes and the engine section soon. And then this is the Raptor engine that will power. BFR, both the, the ship and the booster. It's the same engine. And this is a, approximately a 200 ton thrust engine that's aiming for roughly 300 bar or 300 atmosphere chamber pressure. And depending upon, if, if you have it at a high expansion ratio, it has the potential to have a specific impulse above 380. And it's a stage combustion, full flow, gas gas, for those who are interested in technical details. Yeah, so this is the tra- trajectory. So we'll take off, have booster separation, go into parking orbits, do a translunar injection, fly around the moon, and then come back and land. That should take basically about four or five days. We'll do a bunch of test launches uh, w- without any people on board before having people on board, to be clear. Uh, we will, that's, it's gonna be very important to test this vehicle thoroughly before putting anyone on, on board. Eventually, the BFR will replace SpaceX's existing Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy launch vehicles, as well as the Dragon spacecraft, initially aiming at the Earth launch market, but also adding substantial capability to support long-duration space flight on both lunar and Mars missions.
And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study recommends limiting children's recreational screen time to less than two hours a day. The findings, reported in the Lancet Medical Journal, also recommends that 8- to 11-year-olds have between 9 and 11 hours of sleep a night and at least an hour of daily physical activity. Researchers found only 1 in 20 US children met all three recommended guidelines. They found that on average, children spend 3.5 hours watching screens for entertainment, which displaces sleep or other cognitively challenging activities which may interrupt the stress recovery cycle needed for growth. A new study warns that the immune systems of killer whales, as well as their ability to reproduce, are at extreme risk due to contamination of polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, despite there being a nearly global ban in the chemicals for over 30 years. PCBs were chemicals commonly used in electronics. Now, a report in the journal Science warns that the ongoing PCB threat affects more than half of the world's orcas. It says that over the next 100 years, whale populations near industrialised regions and those at the top of the food chain are at a high risk of population collapse. Well, the United Nations Atomic Energy Agency couldn't find them, so Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has exposed Iran's top-secret nuclear warehouse. It turns out it's in the very heart of Tehran. The Israeli Prime Minister also disclosed the location of three illegal Iranian missile factories in Beirut. Netanyahu provided the corroborating evidence to the United Nations General Assembly, giving the coordinates and warning that the Islamic Republic is now dispersing 15 kilograms of radioactive material throughout Tehran in order to hide it from UN atomic weapons inspectors. The United Nations General Assembly was told this evidence proves Tehran has not abandoned its nuclear weapons program and is simply hiding it. Delegates were told the secret atomic warehouse is being used for storing massive amounts of equipment and material from Iran's secret nuclear weapons program. Paleontologists have discovered an older relative of the Brontosaurus seropod dinosaur in South Africa. A report in the journal Current Biology says the fossils of the 12-ton, 200-million-year-old behemoth were unearthed on a farm on the border of South Africa and Lesotho. They say the gigantic herbivore was one of the first four-legged seropods, but it had yet to develop the elephant-like legs exhibited by most other seropods. Seropods are those dinosaurs with elephant-like bodies and legs, a very long neck and small head at one end, and a long tail at the other. Just think of Dino from the Flintstones. The new dinosaur has been named Lidamadi Mafubi, which means a giant thunderclap at dawn in the African Sesotho language. There's been another major security breach at Facebook, with a social media giant confirming that more than 50 million profiles, including that of the company's boss Mark Zuckerberg, have been hacked. Hackers have exploited a fault that affected the view as feature, which lets people see what their profiles look like to someone else. The tech giant was forced to log out over 90 million accounts to help resolve the issue. With the details, we're joined by Alex Zahar of Reut from IT Wire. There was a vulnerability in the view as that allowed people to upload a happy birthday video, and somehow that gave them access to these tokens. And these tokens were like little keys that allowed you to log back in without having to re-sign in every single time. And the hackers were able to harness those and then break into people's accounts and take them over, including Mark Zuckerberg and his sister, Sheryl Sandberg. And uh, Facebook first announced that there was 50 million. And then they said, look, we've reset the tokens on a total of 90 million accounts. But the clear uh, lesson to be learned from here, and you know, the interesting thing is this hack was detected a year ago, over a year ago. It's taken Facebook a long time to figure this out. And they saw a surge in this view as activity, which tipped them off, so they say, into realizing something was amiss. Now, what it shows is that you shouldn't be using your Facebook login to log into online services because there's also a worry that people were able to use these digital tokens to log into other online services that were authenticated by your Facebook username and password or by a Facebook digital token. So it's a bad idea to use your Google, Twitter, Facebook, 
to log into other sites, you should use a username and password that is separate, you know, that's basically attached to your email. And also, you know, reconsider whether you need to use Facebook at all because they have a long history of security breaches and they say they take it seriously and yet problems keep happening. And of course, that's not the only thing Facebook are in the news about right now. The uh, issue with fake news is still a big one. Facebook say they're working on it, but they haven't done much. Well, look, I mean, the, the problem is that it's, it's hard for, for Facebook to uh, have an algorithm that is trying to stop people from sharing content. I mean, one of the things that happened with Facebook's own data breach was that uh, journalists were putting up stories about Facebook's data breach and Facebook's algorithm was saying, oh, we think this is potentially fake news. So it's, funny a, it's a difficult thing. Funny that, yeah. Now, you've got uh, Facebook that, you know, working with both the Democratic and Republican Institute. Now, these organizations are only loosely aligned with the actual organizations themselves. But look, Facebook is trying to make sure that its website is not a conduit for fake news. And we've seen how foreign entities have manipulated people into thinking that certain posts about President Trump or any number of things were coming from people in the States when they were being sponsored allegedly by the Russians or, or other people. So it's an ongoing fight. You know, probably the lesson to be learned here is don't get your news from Facebook. <laughs> get it from real media sources where, um, in theory, those guys have a reputation. But then, of course, you've got the real media sources that are being alleged to be doing fake news themselves. So, you know, you really have to read widely and use your best judgment. It's a long, long held fact that don't believe everything that's on the internet. And yet people are still full all the time. Well, there's a suck of one every minute, as they say. Yes, P.T. Barnum was right. And that report by Alex Zaharov Reut from ITWire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcasts coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 